Our first reading today is from the book of Amos. Uh, it is most commonly believed that the book of Amos takes place in the period between the division of Israel into two countries, Judah and Israel, and the late Assyrian exile. The prophet rails against the leaders and the elite, promising that God is not only watching, God will soon bring disaster upon them. However, God's anger is not that they are rich or that they hold positions of power. It is their neglect, their callousness toward the poor and the ways of injustice towards those considered less in their society. So Amos chapter 6. Alas for those who are at ease in Zion, for those who feel secure on Mount Samaria. Alas for those who lie on beds of ivory and lounge on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp like David, uh, they improvise instruments of music, who drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first to go into exile and the revelry of the loungers shall pass away. Our next reading comes from the good news according to the Gospel of Luke. And if you were hoping for a slightly easier reading than our first reading, I am sorry to disappoint you. This comes from the point in Luke's Gospel where Jesus is headed towards the crucifixion. He is, knows what is coming. His disciples are still thinking there's going to be this glorious overthrow of the Roman Empire. And as he gets closer, as he gets more opposition from the elite leaders in his religion, as well as the Romans themselves, he gets a little more harsh and a little more cryptic in what he says. And so this morning our reading comes from that section, and it comes after the parable of the dishonest manager, which if you are not familiar with it, is a parable that Jesus tells where a master tells his dishonest manager who has been stealing from him that he is going to take retribution from him in a few days. So the manager goes out, he goes out to the master's clients and he says, you owe $100, make it 50. You owe 1,000, make it 500. And brings that back to his master. And the strange part is the master says, well done. This has that same sort of weird, hard feeling to it and comes after the Pharisees don't react too well to that first parable. There was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at the gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, where he was being tormented. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have 
like Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. May God add a blessing of understanding to our hearing of these words. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts and spirits be inspired by your Holy Spirit and thus made pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Canadian Timothy Schultz is a celebrated sculptor of life-size metal sculptures. His works have included such monuments as the National Mining Memorial in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, and the Canadian's Veteran Memorial. Most of his work, however, revolves around themes from the gospel, inspired by his Christian faith. They have been welcomed and displayed in both churches and some public areas across the world. Some have even been commissioned specifically for the Vatican. His depiction of baby Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, entitled A Quiet Moment, was selected to be placed in Bethlehem as part of a celebration of Jesus' birth. So it might be surprising to hear that one of his statues of Jesus is not always met with welcome, but sometimes by opposition. And that's despite that Pope Francis has blessed it and placed it in the Vatican City. When he first put the sculpture and did the sculpture, thank St. Paul's Cathedral in New York and St. Michael's Cathedral in Ontario rejected it. In Westminster, England, the church there, the Methodist Church, accepted it and applied for an application with the Westminster City Council to have it installed. And it was denied. It's been described by some as being demeaning to Jesus, as creepy or inappropriate. The statues that he has is one of those ones that is starts with a bench, you know, one of those ones you often see historical people sitting on in metal so you can sit next to them and take yourself a selfie with them. Except this time on the bench, it's Jesus. And he's not sitting, he's lying down, covered by a blanket. Only his bare feet with the wounds from the crucifixion visible for identification, and it's entitled Homeless Jesus. Shemal's hopes that when people see this statue, that they'll go through a process, that first they will look at it and actually think for a moment that it is a real, live, homeless person, and then only after a moment recognize that it's actually a statue. Third, he says, they'll realize it's Jesus. So it's a kind of theater in sense, where there's a sequence of how someone understands the piece or how the piece unfolds, which is really great. I feel it's interesting because the idea of the Gospels were that when we see the homeless, when we see the marginalized, we should see Jesus Christ as well. The sculpture visibly translates that idea. Now, Schultz does admit that it's kind of shocking to see Christ, who is usually depicted in a triumphant stance, in such a humble position. Like a lot of those contemporary sculptures honoring politicians and great people, it's a park bench. 
but unlike those where you can sit comfortably beside a famous person, this one, you can sit right there uncomfortably. It's so uncomfortable for some people that they have not only criticized it, but either tried to ban it, petitioned for its removal when it's been installed on in various church grounds around the world. Reaction is generally very um, positive, full of praise for raising awareness of homelessness. And sometimes even sparks calls of concern for somebody's well-being to the police or to the paramedics when someone thinks it's a real person. However, there are also those objections to it being a disgrace or not belonging in their community, not in my backyard. One woman in the affluent community in North Carolina was bold enough to tell of her own reaction up to the sculpture on a local TV news station when she was interviewed by the reporter. Without any embarrassment, she recalled how she had called the police after first seeing it one night because she was concerned about the safety of the neighborhood. She thought it was an actual homeless person. And now that she knew that it wasn't, she said it didn't belong in their neighborhood and that it depicted a false picture of Jesus as it showed him vulnerable and in need. Now, Schmaltz's inspiration for this statue was his own realization of the plight of the homeless in his home city of Toronto, whom he had been passing every day. And so his reply to those who are made uncomfortable by the statue is, this is what the sculpture is supposed to make you think about. It's supposed to make you uneasy. The readings today are also ones that can make us uneasy, especially that parable from the Gospel of Luke. For Jesus tells the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Now this is not the Lazarus of Mary and Martha, but is kind of the John Doe type name that we would use today. The common retelling that is often heard of this parable risks reducing this to a mere morality tale. That if you do A, B will happen to you. So don't do B. And don't especially do A. For the rich man lives in luxury and ignores the plight of Lazarus, who is lying right outside his gate, surrounded by dogs who are licking his wounds. He is poor and in need, and yet each day the man walks back and forth by him. When both die, the rich man finds himself in hell, according to this retelling, but able to see across this great divide that Lazarus is in heaven with Abraham. Now that he's the one suffering, the rich man begs Abraham to send Lazarus with at least a touch of water to provide relief for a moment. Abraham's response is that even if he wanted to, the space between heaven and hell is so big, they just can't. So then the rich man begs Abraham to put in action a sort of ancient story of a Christmas carol. Send Lazarus to his living brothers to warn them while there is still time for them to change. Abraham's answer is that even if he could, it wouldn't have already, would make any difference. They won't change their ways. He tells the rich man that they haven't listened to Moses, to the scripture, so a man returning from the dead isn't going to change them either. And so this sounds like one of those satellite TV provider commercials that bash cable. You know those ones where we are told, don't be Dave, for Dave has cable 
And as a result of this seemingly sequence of events that make no sense, Dave ends up getting bashed by a gorilla. So the telling is, don't be like Dave, and this won't happen to you. And the telling that we have is that we aren't to be like the rich man and ignore the poor, or you'll end up in hell. Yet commentary after commentary after commentary that I referred to this week argued that this is not what the parable is about or addressing at all. That it's not a diatribe against being rich or even money itself, but that it goes much deeper than that. For this parable isn't concerned about with where we end up after death, but what is happening here and now in this life. The parable tells us that the rich man is in Hades, not hell. Hades was the place where everyone who died was believed to have gone to in ancient times, and while there were spots where there was torment, there were plenty where life just continued in a different way. And as I said, this isn't about having wealth 